This first question was about um, the quadrate method. And what they had is they had a bunch of snails in a small little garden. In that garden, what we had is they threw out five different quadrates and they counted the snails in each quadrate each time. And then they said, okay, the quadrate was one square meter. Always note that, uh, the size of the quadrate. But in total, if we, if we calculate the total garden, it is 20 square meters because it's 10 meters wide by two meters long. Then they told you to calculate the average number of snails per quadrant. And that worked out, you added all of these together and you divided it by five and you should have got gotten 10.4 snails. Okay, so 10 and a half snails uh, per quadrant. And then it says that the size of the garden, you have to calculate the population of the snails in the garden. So you take your 20 square meters and you times that by the 10,4 snails per square meter, and you should have received about 208 snails in the garden. And then, okay, yes, Tepo, what's your question? So they get that 20. Okay, um, they said over here um, that the garden was 10 meters wide by two meters long. So if we take uh, area, area is length times breadth. Let me just get an eraser here. Uh, come eraser, work with me. Sorry, for some reason my eraser is not responding. Let me just see what's going on. Let me just create a new page. Um, page, new page before, okay. so. Area is equal to length times breadth, and it was 20 meters long times two meters wide. Uh, sorry, 10 meters long times two meters wide, which gives you 20 square meters, and that's where you got it. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, from there, they told you that, and um, then they ask. Um, Explain how the gardener could avoid, uh, were the samples taken at random and explain your answer. Okay, so uh, it, really, it said if you read through the text, and I don't want to spend too much time on it there, you should have gone through it, uh, that it was taken in different parts of the study area. And so yes, it's taken at random. And then how could the gardener avoid counting the same snails twice? Okay, so you could mark, when he catches the snails or counts the snails, you could mark the snails that he counted, um, or you would remove the snails that he counted so he doesn't count them again. So you would put them in a box or whatever, or you could put a mark on them, and maybe just a little paint mark on the shell. And so when he sees the snail again, he doesn't count it again. Okay, um, which is if we use the Peterson method or the, the mark recapture method, you would actually not, you would count them in the second sample, but we're not using that method, we're using the quadrant sample here. Uh, quadrant method of counting. Now, um, 5.1, uh, think about the estimation. How would the estimate of the population have been different if he had only counted snails in quadrant two and five? Okay, so two, if we take a look at quadrant two, It had eight sample, eight, and five had six. And so it would have been quite different. You would have um, only about 140 snails. So the estimate would have been very low. And then name two ways in which you could have made um, the estimate more reliable, people. You can make your estimate more reliable by increasing your sample size, uh, or repeating the study. Okay. Let's take a look now at 
This was activity 11. They use the mark recapture method. Then, in the mark recapture method, in this question, they sell, tell you that a sample of 21 fish uh, from a dam, all the fish were marked, okay? The fish were then released back into the dam after marking three days after the second, so a second sample of 30 fish was caught. Of these, nine were already marked. Okay, so we use, of course, formula P is equal to M uh, times, what's that? S or T? S divided by T. And so if we take a look at that, let me just create a new page quickly. Uh, new page before. P is equal to M times S divided by T. Uh, how many were marked in the first sample? It was 21. Second sample, that's 30 divided by 9 caught in the second sample. And if we calculate that, I'm not going to do the calculation, I'm just looking at the memo quickly, we get 70 fish with that. So you get in the pond, you get 70 fish. And that's an estimate. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. What does the Dickie stand for again? Uh, the, 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 the S. Stand what does the S stand for? And so second sample. M marked, because you mark everything in the first sample. S stands for second sample, how many you catch in the second sample. And then T is the amount of animals in the second sample that was marked. So that's your oh. recaptured. And um, that's the recaptured um, organisms. Okay. Okay, yes, then they tell you to suggest suitable ways of then uh, marking the fish. Normally what we do with fish is if you take a look at any fin of a fish, uh, it's actually got quite a bit of bony material inside it. So if we, what they would normally do is they will take some like a clipping out of and they'll cut away a part of the, a part of the fin or give them two clips. It normally doesn't affect the fish um, or the way it should swim. And that's something we need to be careful of when we're doing these counts. Whichever method you're doing, using to mark these organisms, you need to make sure that you are not affecting their lifestyle, you are not affecting their um, livelihood, or that they would be caught by predators um, or be seen by predators a lot easier or that it could affect their way of eating. Um, so you need to make sure that it causes the least amount of discomfort to an organism or um, and also that it in their lifestyle it's not going to change or make them more visible. Um, I would for example not if, if I'm doing a study in the Kruger National Park, and I want to do an estimate like this, I wouldn't go and put a bright green or neon orange um, tag on one of these animals because it's going to be clearly visible and they're going to be more visible and then they're going to get caught a lot easier by predators. And so you want to prevent things like that. You also don't want to make a clipping somewhere or mark somewhere that is going to affect the, the way that they walk or cause discomfort to the animals. So just think about that. Okay, so um, then they ask you um, to, how can this technique be used of recreation on sport fishing? Okay, so um, especially if you take a look at, let me just add a page here. Um, okay, if you take a look at especially fly fishing, um, what they do with fly fishing these days is you actually have dams that they um, that they design and they breed the fish. In. So as a fisherman, I want to make sure that there's enough fish, or as a and as the owner of this dam, if I'm if I'm get, letting people catch in here, I want to make sure that there remains enough fish in there, and uh, I don't deplete the population of fish that I have in the dam. And so I would want to assess how many fish do I have in the dam uh, continually so that I can make sure that I, I get, have quotas and I can say to a fisherman, you know what, um, 
you can catch and you can keep or you need to catch and release. And what I normally do these days with um, this, uh, these, this type of sport fishing is I actually have a catch and release policy. Um, but I want to keep stock of, of how much, um, how many animals I have in my dam. Okay, then, next question. How could you mark crabs, snails, or buck? Okay, so paint is a good idea. Um, uh, in, in the case of crabs, uh, waterproof paint on the shell. Um, same with snails. And then um, what we normally do with buck is you would use a, an ear tag or clipping in the ear. Um, an ear tag is nice because if you use binoculars, you can actually see it from quite far away. But unfortunately, of course, with a, um, a clipping, you might not be able to see that from far away. Next question. How could you get more reliable estimate in the number of fish in the dam? Reliability, again, increase your sample size that you are catching or repeat the whole uh, counting process. Let's go on to question two. To find the number of grasshoppers in a maize field, 50 grasshoppers were collected in traps in the field, marked in, uh, with a spot of white paint and released. Two weeks later, 96 grasshoppers were trapped. Of these, eight had spots and white paint on them. Again, you're going to use uh, P equals N divided by, in this case, I used R. Doesn't matter, uh, the formula stays the same. Sometimes I use um, R stands for recaptured. Recaptured. I'm not sure. Why a lot of times they use T in the formula, um, but as long as you remember that they divided by the amount of animals that are or organisms that are recaptured. Okay, so um, and then you replace M with 50, you times that by 96, and you divide it by 8, and you can get an estimate of 600 grasshoppers in the population. Okay. Again, reliability, um, we increase the sample size, then we get, it becomes more reliable. Describe four factors that could affect the validity of the mark recapture method. Okay, so that's, that's what I just talked about a second ago. If, if sampling, if catching the animals, harms the animal in such, in its movement, I'm gonna not have an accurate estimate. Um, if the time period is not long enough for them to mix in between one another, um, I'm going to have um, a false population estimate. If the sample, if, if the time period is too long, I'm going to have immigration, immigration, births and deaths having an effect on the population size. And so then it's not going to be accurate. Okay, so that was your homework. Let's go into um, limiting factors um, and carrying capacity. Yes, Recall, is there a question before we start? Yes, Tepo? Um, so for 1.4. Yes. Is it um, okay if I say you can mark the crabs with a permanent marker? A uh, permanent marker would normally work, yes. Okay, so that's a very good suggestion and it's an easy one because it's so easy to use. Um, and it's going to last probably a few days that the, the mark will stay on there. Uh, so it's a good one to use, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Then, let's just recap on some of yesterday. So what is population or population density? is the number of individuals in a certain area or per unit area or volume. Why do we say volume? Because, um, for example, say virus. Uh, I can actually um, count the number of viruses in a in a container, and so that that not just area but volume, because they spread in three dimensions in that container. Population parameters: we say natality or births add to the population. We say that mortality decreases the population, deaths decrease the population. Immigration increases the population and immigration moving out decreases the population. Okay, and we're gonna work with these factors. 
as we go through these density dependent factors that we're going to take a look at now. Now, resources and the size of a population. So let's say, for example, um, that, and I made a drawing here, let's say, for example, that the brown that you see over here, those are organisms. The brown is some of the organisms. Okay, so that is um, uh, bacteria, for example. And the green I have over here, that is food. So those are resources. So in this case, we can see that resources are plentiful. There's a lot more food in here then there is bacteria. And so it's, it's a pretty nice environment. Okay, so it's a nice environment for them to live in. Then, if resources are plentiful, then the parameters of natality, mortality, immigration, and immigration will determine the growth of the population. So what do you think is going to happen here? There's more than enough resources. So what are they going to do? They're going to do what animals do or organisms do in nature. Some reason my it's stored, my system is stalling a bit. There we go. So it's going to increase. The population is going to increase. We're going to have a lot of natality, very little mortality. So a lot of birth, but very little death. And we might even have organisms coming into the area because resources. There's resources that they can use. Okay. Then. Limiting factors in the environment may lower the birth rate or increase the death rate and then include density independent and density independent factors. As populations increase, the density gets higher. The more crowded the population, the more we're going to find certain things happening like disease, competition, predation, and territoriality. Okay, so as the number of organisms increase here and resources become less and less, they're going to start fighting with one another. And as they fight with one another, it might cause deaths or it might uh, cause certain organisms to leave. Okay, Ron, you have a question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, your, your volume seems to go up. Okay. Um, let me just double check on what's going on. I think it might be a, a prom problem with my Okay. How is my volume at the moment? Ruan? Are you are muted at the moment? Um so it's fine, sir. Okay. Okay, is it better? No, yes, sir. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's take a look again. Let me just share, share my screen. Okay, so um, as, comp as there is more animals in here, they're going to fight more. It's going to cause some animals to leave the area and it's going to cause some deaths. Also, um, what could happen is that if there is a disease in here, if the population is um, dense, then diseases spread a lot easier. And we're finding this with COVID now at this stage. In, in areas where populations are, where there's a lot of people in a small area, um, the disease just spreads a lot quicker because people are closer to one another. And uh, that is why if you take a look at how quickly it spread through China, one of the reasons was the fact that they are so densely populated in China. There's so many people in China. So um, flu spreads quickly, corona spread quickly through China. So the, the, the denser, the, the, the higher the population uh, density, the, the easier these diseases will spread. Some other things, predation and territoriality, uh, disease, competition. Okay, um, the one that we haven't discussed is predation. So 
what will happen is, and we're going to see this in, in some of the lessons that are still to follow, is that if population, if the population is high, if the population density is high, so this is population and this is time. Okay. If the population increases, what happens is that um, the pre predators have enough food to eat. So as the population increases, the predators also increase. And as they increase, it stabilizes my population and then there's a decrease. What, what we then find is that in the end, we have this typical pattern. We call it a predator-prey relationship where it does this. As the, the, the prey increases, so my computer's doing funny things. Then um, this increases and the predator and the prey actually balance one another out. Okay. Now, let's take a look at our next slide. These are called density dependent factors because it depends on the density. If the density is low, it goes well. If the density is high, it doesn't go well. Um, and so we, we call this density dependent factors. Um, and then it, it causes what we call a carrying capacity or a stay um, where organisms are going to stay at a certain number um, be, as soon as they reach a certain density in an area. And this is because of what we talked about disease, predation, competition, and also the bulk up of waste products. Um, also, the, which relates to the, that it's going to cause diseases. But we also have density independent factors. Now, density independent factors are things that are not affected by density. So, things like floods, droughts, um, though we are uh, earthquakes, um, these are. The earthquake was going to be there, whether there was a dense population or not. And what we find with this is that we normally find that there's a lot of deaths at a at a certain stage, and then the population will slowly then recover. Um, but it's a sudden thing. There's a sudden death, and then afterwards, it recovers, the population recovers, but it's not dependent on the density of the population. Carrying capacity. Okay, so carrying capacity is when we reach a certain stage where our population is going to become stable. And so this is a typical population graph when animals are introduced into an area. Our first part over here, we call this the lag phase. Okay, so this is the lag phase. We're going to have more detail on this in the le next lessons. Lag phase. In the lag phase, there's not much population growth. Um, what, whatever um, animals are introduced into the area, um, they, they breed very slowly. They get to know one another first before they start making families and doing what animals do. And then you have the growth phase where it's exponential growth. Then it slows down. And then finally, up top here, it actually, it actually stabilizes and starts doing this. And so it stays there at the carrying capacity. Whenever there's more animals that the area cannot support, then um, then some animals are going to die, and as soon as then um, there's in or, or move out immigration or mortality, and as soon as there's then more food for them, they start increasing again, decrease, increase, decrease, and that's what happens with the carrying capacity. That's the carrying capacity of a certain area. But this is only one type of, of graph. We're going to discuss some other types uh, later. Um, but this is the 
basic population graph and most organisms on earth will follow this uh, not viruses not bacteria and unfortunately not humans but most other larger animals on earth follow this typical growth pattern in their population okay i'm going to stop there